Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. Good morning, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. Welcome to Everything Cooperative. Uh, This morning, we have the absolute pleasure of having Sarah Horowitz on the line with us this morning. She is the founder of the Freelancers Union and the Freelancers Insurance Company. She was formerly the chair of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. That's big stuff. She is a recipient of the MacArthur Fellowship and has been featured on NPR, The New Yorker, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Atlantic. She's a lifetime mutualist. She lives in Brooklyn, New York, with her husband and daughter, and she has a book out called Mutualism. Good morning, Sarah. Hello. Good morning. Nice to be here. Thank you so much for taking time out to be with us this morning to share your book and your life and mutualism. I want to start talking about this cover page on your book. It says you can't judge a book by its cover, but this cover is beautiful. It has an orange lily, a white lily, a bumblebee, and a daisy on it. Uh, It's coming up out of the ground with green stalks. It's just absolutely beautiful. What does mutualism mean in the natural world? Why this picture? Yeah, yeah, that's such a great question. It's because mutualism is really a a part of our earth, a part of the way we live. It's based on the reciprocity of how we can be here and do well only by realizing that we are dependent on one another. The bee pollinates the flower, and that's how um, the bee gets its food. The flowers get pollinated, and it really points up that we need an economy that is really based on those ideas. Reciprocity meaning... But people don't just say, hey, you just keep doing for me, all good. You say, what do you need? What can I offer? That once we start to realize that we're in this together and that we can be cooperatively based, then we all prosper. We all do better. And that's a very different model than this individualistic go get them. You know, I can take what I want. I can destroy the earth and build a house the way I want. We can say, wait a minute, we're here with nature. We're connected intergenerationally. We got so much from our parents and grandparents, and we must give so much to our children and grandchildren. So we're connected, this mutualism. In the real world, you've got plants working with the bumblebee, with bees or insects. When I looked it up, you have animals supporting each other. One plant may be taking the insects off of another plant to get their food, and they also keep the other bigger animal free of the insects. So you get this, what you call reciprocity of I help you, you help me, and we all get better. Is yeah. That, that's it? Well, you know what? It, well, it, it's, a, it's such a core tenant of how we as, as human beings got here. And it's such a core tenet to what we need to do to build the future for our children and grandchildren that we want. But we've forgotten that. And so what we've done is we've changed it so that everything is kind of like hyper oriented around profit and businesses that can extract resources and make the investors wealthy. And we call that the economy. But in fact, mutualism really teaches us, no, 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 no. That's like one view of an economy. There's really another view of an economy that's actually much longer and much more promising to meet the needs of our future, um, the future that's facing us. Okay, so uh, the economy that we have and the economy that I learned when I got my MBA and I was fortunate enough to go to Stanford, I, I grew up in Bluefield, West Virginia on a mountaintop. And so this little black boy got to a Stanford and I we could talk about how that happened, but in that economic class, and I didn't get it then, they talked about this extraction, this, this, this whole world. I didn't, I, I didn't get that world, but this world of mutualism, 
Okay. Can you talk about, you mentioned that's our, what our grandfathers and great grandfathers, can you go, go to history a little bit more and talk about how this has worked in the past? Yeah, I mean, one of the things, we let's just talk about the U.S., but really we could talk globally. When you look at our history, Benjamin Franklin had the first mutual. He had a fire insurance mutual because people had regular fires, and if they didn't come together to, to protect their homes, it wouldn't work if you just tried to do it by yourself. The African-American community has the richest history of mutualism, starting with, as Professor Nembars has talked so well about in Collective Courage, the idea of people coming together for burial, for banking, and starting to build these kinds of institutions along with the AME Zion Church. And then when you kind of go fast forward to A. Philip Randolph, who was the leader who built the sleeping car, Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, and brought that into the AFL-CIO and literally integrated the AFL-CIO. And while he was at it, integrated the military. And what you see is these formed the base of the civil rights movement. For me, growing up, I started to look at the Amalgamated Clothing Workers Union, who are all these garment workers, and they built their own banks and insurance companies. And as they built those institutions, just like the civil rights movement, these became the base for the New Deal. And so mutualism has a proud history with unionized pension funds and cooperatives alone. They're trillion-dollar industries. So what we need to do is say, we know how to solve problems. We've got this. So let's go to the experts as we now are thinking about the next safety net for health care and health insurance and retirement and training. Let's not let it go the one way that we know, which is this very short term, you know, greedy system and go back to something that actually works and really is based on excellence and reciprocity and self-help, which we know works. Okay. You just said a whole lot. So let me try to break that down a little <laughs> bit. Okay. That there's this rich history. Now, we've had Jessica Gordon Nimhart on the show about four times through the seven and a half years we've been doing this. And I, I just, I learned so much from her and her book, Collective Carriage. So she's an African-American woman. And what she told me was when she started this study of cooperatives, she was told that blacks don't do this, this mutualism that you're talking about, this cooperativism, that that's a white hippie, yogurt eating, tofu eating people that, you know, that, that smokes marijuana and they sit around. They're the ones that call it chart that gets this co-op thing, but blacks don't do that. And then she's gone, she studied for 15 years before she did this book. And she just unearthed all of this history, yeah. whether it's yeah. A. Philip Randolph, Bernard Rustin, W.B. Du Bois, uh, Nanny Helen Burroughs, just on and on and on and on of folks that have Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks, just this working together collectively, pulling each other up by our bootstrings. Yes, yeah, by our bootstrings, but I pull up Sarah and Sarah pulls up Vernon and we're down the neighbors down and we help pull up everybody. And so we're yeah. much better off. Okay. That's what you were talking about in this history. And that's why I yeah. love Jessica Gordon Emhart and the work that she continues to do. She says she keeps yeah. finding things out. No. And you know, it's funny. Once you start looking at this, you realize that, you know, yeah, great, you know, hippie people doing yoga, you know, all good. But it's really also every single ethnic group that's ever come to America. Like, it's not that people just individually, you know, started their own business and yay, they got wealthy. They have lending circles. Korean Americans, that's how the dry cleaning businesses were started all across cities. You know, similarly with South Asian communities and buying up motels. It's there had to be collectivity in it because there was no way one person could get that kind of money to start something. And so, you know, I appreciate the way you're saying this because this is both spiritual and deep, but it's not quaint and cute. And what I mean by that is don't think this isn't serious. It's extremely serious. The mutualist sector that's made up of faith communities, 
and cooperatives and unions and mutual aid groups is in the trillions of dollars. It's real. It's got a history. It's got a legacy. And it has a future. Why is it that this isn't talked about? It isn't known. It isn't in the political circles. It isn't in the economic circles. Why, why do you think that's so? You know, I don't want to be simplistic, so I'm going to say it's really complicated, but I'm going to give you a simple answer anyway, which is, I think, Ronald Reagan. You know, that president really changed the course of history, and I would say there's a whole generation or two that just weren't taught this. And so we we didn't get to pass the baton like the relay race where you pass, which we each did from generation. I learned this from my parents and their grandparents and the people I knew and grew up with. And so I think there's a little bit of amnesia. And also because we've set the table for capitalism, right? Like, listen, I think I believe in markets, don't get me wrong, but we've really set the table so that we've made it so that the one-tenth of one percent are the ones who are able to make up the rules, and I'll give you an example. Workers across the country save their money for their retirement. The pensions then go into pension funds, but the rules are that you can't use those pension funds really to invest in these areas mutualistically and build housing and cooperatives. So we've deprived our own sector of the capital we've created. Instead, all that money that people put in their pensions, their retirement, goes to venture capital and private equity for really fast investment. And we're no longer connected to that money. That's what I mean by these are how some of the rules have been written. And we have to go back and say, wait a minute, like we're having a housing crisis. We're having a health care crisis. We could be building out the cooperative sector, which has, has these wonderful effects of supporting communities with jobs and can be built for greenness for green jobs and infrastructure and municipal grids, right? We, we could have an explosion of creativity of how we would build back our communities using our own money, recycling it back. But sometimes I think after Ronald Reagan, we said, yeah, we don't do that. We, the progressive world, yeah, that's money. We don't do that. That's like somebody else should worry about that. But I think we have to get back our money and pay attention to that. Sarah, you just taught me something because when I look at um, Co-op City, I don't know if it's 90,000 units in Co-op City, housing co-ops or 900,000, but that was built with amalgamated uh, pension fund money. And yeah. now you say they have rules where you can't use that pension fund. That's news mm. to me. Well, also, if you go back, you know how you said to me, like, how is it that people don't know this? So. In my book, I ended up relying on somebody I knew who has a PhD. Her name is Layla Voral, who studied this topic. And New York State passed legislation to give capital to enable and rule. So that's what I Thank you. We're going to come back to that. That's where we're going to take our first break. But we're going to come back and talk about (laughs) what you just said. We'll be right back, everybody. Don't touch that down. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks, and the program is Everything Cooperative. And we have Sarah Horowitz on the on the line with us this morning. We're talking about mutualism. Sarah, I have mutualism is as old as dirt, that what's at the core of humanity is this supporting each other, working together, bringing each other up. And there is something called Ubuntu, uh, which is a Southern African way of being, which says that I am because Sarah is, and Sarah is because I am. And if you go back and look at all of the tribes, uh, that's the way they were on the plains here in the U.S., in Alaska, in Africa, everywhere in Asia. Everybody had their job to do. they all working together. So what you were saying before we took break was the New York State got this message and they passed laws that we could use the pension funds to help each other out in building housing. 
Can you go back to that a little bit and, and, and weave in, if you do believe it, as I do, this is the core of humanity. This is what it is all about. And you mentioned spirituality again, but okay, before. Can you re- weave in what you were saying about New York State passing a law and how this fits in with the past? Yeah, because, you know, when you look at these mutualists, starting with the African-American community and the benevolent associations and the unions like the garment workers, they sort of, on their economic base, they start to have political power. So the union started to say, we want to start to build housing throughout, let's say just New York, but it was that area, but it happened all over the country. And the New York state legislature gave them all sorts of things that they needed so that they could get the capital they needed, they got the tax breaks they needed. Metropolitan Life Insurance Company could also put in money because it got those tax credits. In other words, the the unions said to the government, this is what you need to do to get worker housing to be sustainable. And the legislature was like, yes. And it wasn't because they were nice. It's because the unions had the vote. And so we have to start to get to that same place to say, hey, every disaster that hits America, we have all this wonderful mutual activity, starting with the very dirt under us. People start to help each other get food and medicine and take care of each other. And then FEMA comes in and says, hey, we got it. See you later. And then they typically outsource so much of it to the non-local groups. We have to go back and say, no, 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 government, your job is to build mutualism. But it will happen once we build our base and we start to articulate what does that mean. And that's what amalgamated clothing workers did. That's what the civil rights movement did. That's what the black churches did with the community development, financial institutions. You can see this. So we're now at this point. We have a big vacuum in government since Reagan. We have a president that gets it and really wants to see things happen. And that's where we have to now start to get ourselves together to say, this is what we need. This is how we will um, have the society that's based on us connecting to each other, not fighting each other. Okay. So we have an example in New York where all of this came together and you ended up with this massive cooperative housing. And Sarah, I'd learned about co-ops because I would started a property management business in D.C. to make money because I came out of, like I said, the MBA. I'm a capitalist. I wanted to make money, so I wanted to buy properties myself, manage third-party properties, and then make money both ways. It didn't quite work that way, but it was, it was good. But I learned about housing co-ops. I learned about limited equity housing co-ops which I didn't like at first, Sarah, because I thought it was white folks telling black people they could not get profit. They limited their profit. But when I got to learn about limited equity housing co-ops, and the alternative was apartment buildings, limited equity housing co-ops outperformed apartment buildings for the residents every which way you can look at it. And I couldn't figure out why government didn't put more money into that HUD. So I learned about co-ops in managing this, and that's, to me, when you talk about spiritualism, and the, that is why I started this property management business, so I could learn about our history of mutualism. We're but all I on liked, journeys, right? Yes. I liked watching people that may have had a high school education at best make extremely good, informed, long-term decisions. I liked watching mostly women okay, black women in Washington, D.C., in these limited equity housing co-ops have arguments, have disagreements, and resolve them and move forward with long-term, really good decisions. So I fell in love with co-ops, watching how people operated, because of the fifth principle of co-ops is education, training, and information. So they had gotten educated on how to make decisions and how to work together and how to resolve issues and problems. And I'm going, boy, if Washington could get that, if our politicians could get that. So that's that was my intro to this whole cooperative world. What is your intro to it? You mentioned a little bit about your grandparents and parents and all of that, but how did you get into this mutualism world? Yeah, you know, it's 
it's funny that you're talking about these limited equity cooperatives. So my grandmother, my grandfather was the vice president of the Ladies Garment Workers Union. He was he was a garment worker, came here as an immigrant. And my grandmother lived in that union housing till she was 96 years old. And it was just what you're saying. You know, she never had to worry. She didn't ever earn a lot of money. She sewed. She was like the only person that saved money on Social Security, I think. And um, we used to go visit her. And I never thought about it, you know. And then when I was little, my parents were in a babysitting co-op that they made up using Monopoly money so that all the parents in the neighborhood didn't have to spend money on child care so much. And they could go out. Excuse me, I'm sorry. They literally used Monopoly money? Yeah, but I remember my mother had like a, a white envelope that she put in the drawer and it was the money that she got from babysitting. And when you got had no more money, you had to call your friends and say, anybody need a babysitter? And then you'd go out babysitting. And so I think I just thought that was normal. And then I worked for unions. I studied unions at Cornell. And so when I started with the freelancers union, I, of course, just said, what would Sidney Holman at Amalgamated Clothing Workers do? And I listened, and this is a principle of mutualism, is that it's built from the ground up. When I talked to freelancers, they said their biggest issue was health insurance. So I just started organizing people around health insurance and realized that there was a mutualist way to do it and there was a traditional way to do it. But if we started to build it and had it be owned by the nonprofit, we could take the money and recycle it back into our community and then start to take care of one another and start to build that out. So we had an insurance company. We even had a technology firm, a medical practice. We just took care of of ourselves and we built an insurance company that for three years did not have a premium increase. But let me go all the way back. What's a freelancer? Well, you know, now that's a really hard question, but I'll just tell you, it's somebody who works on their own and there's one part that works sometimes on gigs and there's a lot of controversy about whether they are employees and how they should be classified. But the group that Freelancers Union represents are freelancers who they are are designers or writers or people who drive cabs who, you know, it's a a range of of workers, but who want to be freelancers, want to control their schedules, and they get a 1099 on their taxes. So it pretty much could be anybody that gets a 1099. They're not an employee. They produce, but they set their own schedules, uh, 1099ers do. Okay, and then they get paid from some kind of contractual basis as opposed to an hourly basis normally. And they'll be the majority by 2027. But what's interesting about freelancers to me is they end up being practicing mutualists because they've flipped the equation of how we work, where they control their time and decide how they're going to structure their day. And I think that's where I really started to understand the spiritual nature of this, because people were saying, I want to have time, time to eat, to have a rhythm in my life to care about people, to walk my dog. I don't want to just be told, you know, you're a worker, be productive, you know, life has been retired, you know? And I I feel like that's what we're now all saying. When we look at mutualism, we're saying, how do we work together and be connected so we can have rich lives, that we can have summer houses? And my grandfather's union it wasn't that workers didn't want to be in the green and be under trees. They couldn't afford it. So the unions coordinated those. Okay, so we have this rich, 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 rich history of this sort of unions and faith-based organizations, mutual aid going back to Ben Franklin, going back to slaves, pooling their money together to bury people, coming together and studying at night, creating educational institutions, creating churches so we have this rich rich history that we seem to have forgotten and i have it that the one percenters didn't want us to know about it (laughs) okay (laughs) because that meant that if we knew about mutualism and we created cooperatives or whatever you want to call them then that profit that was to be made became the profit of the members and not the profit of the shareholders, the one percenters that had the yeah. capital, the capitalists. 
So I think there was two forces happening where people just did not understand this. Yeah, no, and I think right now the right attacks because it's focused on individuals and the market and wanting the markets to be as free as possible. But the left misses it because the left doesn't realize that when you just think everything comes from government, you miss this whole picture. We got to go. We'll come right back and talk about the left and the right in the political structure. We'll be right back. Please don't touch that dial. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. Welcome back to Everything Cooperative. We have with us today Sarah Horowitz, which I want to suggest to you all, if you don't know it, she's one of those valiant women that, that where her name is going to be on this, this list of names when we say say their names because she refuses to be silent. And we've already talked about getting that vote out and whether or not it was the unions in the past to get in the political world because they had the votes in New York, and so they got to Congress, or the, the uh, Senate and the House of New York to pass laws that would help the people and create affordable housing and other kinds of things. Sarah, thank you so much for your book. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you for the wisdom that you're giving us and bringing this all to light. When we were talking, uh, we were talking about New York. New York right now um they have been given $2.5 million a year to create worker co-ops. I think that's the right amount for the last two or three years. So they're still on the front lines of cities helping to create co-ops. And I think this is a good time. We've talked about uh, housing co-ops. We haven't spent so much time talking about the other ones, but let me quickly say there are four types of co-ops. It depends on who owns and controls that business. So if it is owned and controlled by the employees, it's called a worker co-op. And therefore, that could be any business you can think of. If it's owned and controlled by the people that uses the products or services, those are consumers, and it's called a consumer co-op. Housing co-ops we talked about, credit unions. Food co-ops could be either or both. They could be a worker co-op or a consumer co-op. The people that shop there could own it or the people that work there. And I've seen some that are both, that 60% may be owned by the consumer and 40% by the employees or whatever the people say, which is always what you are talking about before we got off, took our last break. The other two are which farmers use a lot, artists are beginning to use, and it would be interesting to see what these freelancers are. It's a group that are, it's called a purchasing co-op because they, the group of people, farmers, come together, create a business that buys what they need to do their farming. And so they buy in volume, they buy, they get a better price, they get a better quality because this company, the people in this company become experts in working with the vendors and experts in the product that they are needing. So that helps the farmer, or I say like artists are beginning to use it. In DC, there's something called a Consumer Purchasing Alliance that works with nonprofits and charter schools and churches to help them come together to buy what they need to buy. And the fourth type, again, farmers use it a lot, is called a marketing co-op. And it's when farmers get together and say, we want to create a business that will market our products. So you may have a dairy farm in Wisconsin come together and they uh, create a dairy company like Cabot Creamery or Lando Lakes, or then you have Ocean Spray. And then, so they put all of their milk into this business and they sell it. They may be in Wisconsin, but they sell it in New York or California or any other markets that that individual farmer could not get. And they normally get a better price. And they add value to it. They make cream cheese and all of this other stuff to it. And so sometimes those are called producer co-ops. There's a black women's co-op in Pittsburgh, Sarah. They call themselves Ujama and U-J-A-M-A-A. And they have come together and they have a storefront where they make their necklaces and they sew and they have wood work uh, kinds of things. They're artists. And then they can have a, a storefront where each individual artist could not do it, but collectively they can have a storefront and they work it and they have great, great, great product. You could go in on their webpage, Ujama, and find out about this. I went there one July three or four years ago and bought all of my Christmas gifts. 
phenomenal. I told them the only problem I had, and you'll find this interesting as a customer, their prices were too low for the quality that they had. Okay. <laughs> okay. So you're one of the valiant women of the vote. We are talked about these different co-ops, these different types of co-ops. You've talked about also mutual aid, faith-based, and unions as other mutual organizations. You know, sorry to interrupt. Can I just say what I think no. is really yes. interesting about all these groups is that what we need to do is look at how FDR said to unions, here's a job. You're going to bargain for better wages, which is going to make people go into the working class and middle class. And you're the only ones that are going to do it. Employers can't do it. And you're going to get special rules. And so we're going to clear a lane in the highway for you. And when we look now at all this great explosion of new co-ops and mutual aid groups, we have to start to say the real role of government is to create a lane on this highway. Give us a job. Let the credit unions deliver retirement. Let unions and cooperatives be involved in training. And let's start going to these groups, like the groups that you're talking about in New York City. They're all on the ground already. And let's start to say, how do we take those that are doing well and help them? What do they need? What are the laws? What are the regulations? And how do we make them grow? And to your earlier point, it's almost like the elected officials have to learn, too, because they don't know. So they are like, listen, we have all these COVID vaccines we have to give out. Let's just do it through pharmacies because there's a pharmacy in every neighborhood. But if we actually had been practicing mutualism, we would have said, OK, fine. Like every every good idea is a good idea. But how about unions and credit unions and churches and mosques and synagogues? We're all very connected in our communities and we could have been playing a role, too. So we have to get to this mindset of, like, give us a job, give us a lane on this highway. And that, I think, is the political thing that we have to start mobilizing toward. Okay. I want to come back to this, but it's like, how do we get those politicians? How do we – you mentioned the Biden. You didn't use Biden Harris administration. You didn't call them by name, but they're there now. How do we get to them to get them to the place where they they understand this? And that is one of, now let me just ask you that now. You have a sense of how do we get to them to get this into their, it would be nice if they had in their first hundred days, but in their, in, in the four or eight years that they may be in, how do we get to them so that they can create this lane for these co-ops and mutual aid and churches, faith-based organizations? Well, when I started this book, I wanted to start this conversation. So, People can go to build-mutualism.net, and we're starting to build our base, right? We're starting to just gather people to find one another and to start to create a network so people can see all the great stuff that exists. So the first step is we have to map it ourselves. And there have been all these wonderful mapping projects, again, the problem isn't for lack of smart people around the country, but we have to get more unified in the way that we're connected. And then we need to go to the elected officials. They're elected officials, after all, and start to show them this is where the votes are going to be. This is where the economy is going to be. This is how we want to lead our lives. And I think it's a cultural change. We have to get off this 140-character Twitter world of critique where we just complain and we're comfortable. We have to become builders again and start to say we, we have to be part of what we're building. Go back to the bees and the flowers and that interconnection and start to then connect these big ideas, build out our own institutions, and then articulate that electorally and politically in, in an advocacy way. Okay. So what you're doing with build-mutualism.net is exactly what Vernon Oaks has been doing with everything.coop. Everything.coop, you can go in and sign up. I just went in to build mutualism. That is, go in. Everybody out there, I'd appreciate it if you would go in to B-U-I-L-D-M-U-T-U-A-L-I-S-M.net. And you can sign up. Just put your email address in. It comes right up buy mutualism, download a study guide. There's much you can do here. Events that are coming up, you can learn more and you can take action. 
And this is the question that I asked Sarah. And Sarah, we've just met, but we <laughs> we've been mutually friends. <laughs> All of my life and probably in our history, although it wasn't talked about at my dinner table like it was in your union table. We were union people. My grandfather in the mines and my father in the mines in West Virginia right. and my father on the railroad. I, I, they very much talk about was unions. Was he a Cleveland car porter or what, what work did he do? Beg your pardon? What work did he do? On the train. My, my father, he was in the yard. It's in the yard. And he was called a brakeman. Yeah. And I did that two summers in college where a train would come in from the coal fields. And let's say it had 100 cars and you want to break them up. Some are going north to New York. Some are going to Florida. Some may be going to California. So you, you that's what you would do. You break them up. And that was yeah. a brakeman in the yard. Sometimes I would go out on the road and it's a brakeman going out on the road. At that time in 1970, uh, 1968 or so, there were no break. There were very few black brakemen on the road because they made more money, and there were no black engineers running those trains. Okay, that just yeah. wasn't happening. So uh, you, you saw the racism, but that was it was a fun job and probably the easiest job I ever had. I used to feel f- bad for my dad because he'd come home dirty. Well, that's just the wind blowing the coal in your face. It was an easy job, almost too easy. But at any rate, unions was huge in our world. Unions were huge. And because my f- grandfather was World War One and my father was World War Two, they had both had a world. And my mother was also World War. She was in the Army. Both my father, that's how it, where they met. So there was this world view, particularly as it related to unions. But it was not let's go start a business. Let's go figure out how we could do more of this. But it. It was always about, in the black community, an extended family. There was always okay. somebody feet under our table, that always sharing. Sharing yeah. was huge. I need a cup of sugar. I need, it was huge at what we, what we did. So this mutualism, this, this cooperativism, that was a part of growing up. Yeah. It was in it, and not called it, but it was totally into how we survived particular in downturns. You know, I feel like this is another thing that this generation will rebuild, but it has lost, is we shared our institutional space. Like Professor Numbars talked about the cooperatives being a meeting place in the Deep South, right? Like I can remember, like unions always helped out with space or a desk or whatever you needed. You could just share. And like when you were saying everything co-op and build mutualism, no one, no one is looking to be the only one because we're a network. Yes, we are a network, and sharing, whether that was the church, the union hall, at Bluefield State College, historically black college, if you had a meeting or something, you could go get it there. There was always this sharing. Yeah, sharing whatever assets there were, whatever breadcrumbs we had, how we pull it together and make something out of it like almost like magic, like this picture on your book, Mutualism is the book with this bumblebee flying over a yellow, an orange, and a white flower with all of the color and the majesty of it. And it's like it happens. And somewhere we lost that. Well, we haven't lost it, but we don't talk about it. So I'm glad you We need to rebuild it. We just need to exercise our muscles. We've lost our muscle memory, so it'll be back. So everybody out there, this is a fascinating conversation. We'll be back after our last break. I really want to talk more about future when we come back. We could spend time talking about past, present, but I really want to get more into future. And please go to build, B-U-I-L-D dash mutualism dot net. Sign up. Look at it. Listen to it. Let's build a political base here. Political base, somebody told me, Sarah, I read a book once, says politicians are a group of people that come together to solve community problems. That has not been my experience with politicians. Politicians too often are people that come together to figure out how they can make money for themselves or their family, but not the society. But this is what we're talking about building. Politicians and organizations that come together to solve communities. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks, and the program is Everything Cooperative. We have Sarah Horowitz on the line with us today. 
And I've got to just give a shout out to the National Cooperative Bank. They have been our sponsor for the seven and a half years that we've been on. The National Cooperative Bank, Chuck Snyder and folks, um, their, their mission, and they were created by the government to help co-ops. This, this is uh, somebody had the, the vision that there was needing money, and yeah. NCB's mission is to support and be an advocate for American cooperatives and their members, especially in low-income communities, by providing innovative financial and related services, and they were created in the 80s. Uh, to do just that, and that's what they've been doing very, very successfully. And so they helped to create this radio show so that we could give you information about what you can do to start a co-op, to find a co-op to do work with. There's all kinds of good benefits that co-op do for their community. And right now we're talking to Sarah Horowitz about even other organizations. They could be faith-based organizations, that have been doing mutualism from, again, I believe since the beginning of time, mutual aid organizations, and don't forget unions. And unions are critical in this, both in saving and getting pension monies and in helping out the individual at the, on the workplace. Sarah, we got 12 more minutes. I want to talk future. I'm not, I could love to go back and talk about the past some more or where we are today, but what do we have to do to make this mutualism work? What do you think? You know, I think that one thing that we know is that it's our instinct, right? So first is you don't have to, like, wait for it or, you know, sit in a chair and think really hard and, you know, it's going to come. What you really have to do is say, what are your needs? And what I think is really interesting is, you know, Silicon Valley can see mutualism, too, and they understand this. So there's a reason that Facebook groups are like the biggest part of Facebook now. And Google has started Google Groups. And Substack is a way to create your own newsletter and ask your subscribers for money and start to build a community. And so it's clear to me that there's ways to start to immediately build. If you want to build in your community, you know, I would start with Facebook, but I would get off it as fast as you can. It doesn't matter if you create your own spreadsheet, but just keep track. And then to start to say, you have to exchange something, time or money. So have some leadership. So start a group of something you care about, ask people to contribute and listen to what it is. Would they, what do they need? Maybe sometimes people just need a place to go and break bread and have a meal together. But if you collectively make your meal, what costs you $5, you get back $7 of worth. So start on a basic level. And then if you're like, you know what, I'm not a change agent, that doesn't speak to me, then find out, go to your faith community and find out, are there, are there things that other congregants need that you can start to organize a food drive? Is there a need um, to build. Are there people, every, every faith community has a, a, has a loving kindness community that goes and visits people when they're sick. But does somebody need something built? Go organize that. If a union's on strike or there's an organizing drive and you see people outside with a sign, go stand with them. So there's all sorts of ways to get started. Okay, so you've just hit a lot because in our church, there's this loving kindness calling people, visiting people when they're sick or when there's a death or anything. It's, it's always this extension, and that's since I was a kid. But also in my fraternity, it's the same kind of thing, particularly working with the seniors in the fraternity. So there's different organizations that one can go to that's already in existence to do this, or you can start your own. And what, you're, what I heard you saying was you can become a leader. You didn't use that word. Uh, you can become a leader and start something, looking at what your community needs, always community-driven. Yes. What's the needs of the community? Yes. And also, I think there's nothing wrong with being a leader. You know, I don't, I don't subscribe. I think we need leaders. And so we got to have grown-ups in the room, and we need to start to have people who have some skin in the game. People care about their faith community because they need it, and they're not going to let something happen to it. And so – you really want to develop that mindset. It's not just like, this is a cause. We're all going to go to petition.com and sign up for it. Like, that's great. But really what you want to do is what's our community? Who's in it? How do we set up some boundary around it? And how do we pull out our wallet 
doesn't have to be a lot of money, so that we are taking care of each other in a deeper way. And then we really have to care about it so that we want to pass that on from generation to generation. But you can start your own now. It's easier than ever. You can join. And what you'll see, and I 100% know that you're going to agree with me, when you look at people who are connected mutualistically, they tend to be less depressed. They have less anxiety. It's kind of more fulfilling because when you go through life being connected to people, that's a very rich life. And that really gets us back to the beginning of what we're talking about, because it is it is that spirituality and that sense of connection. And at the end of a life, that's what you reflect on. So wade in, find where it speaks to you, but like make it a resolution this year that you'll be a mutualist in one way in your life this next year. So what you've done with your book, you have just basically put a name on what's already happening out there. It's already been happening it's already happened since the beginning of time of us coming together working together but what i want to share with you real quickly i had a lady on from finland 2017 and 2017 the united nations declared the people in finland as the happiest people in the world okay they do this whole metrics and and they say uh who's the happiest country and they say the people of finland are the happiest so marjorie Director of Cooperative Affairs in Finland, and as his SOK Corporation, she said when I asked her why are people happier in Finland, she had already said that Finland have more people in co-ops than anywhere else in the world. That on average, of Finland there was belong to five different co-ops, and she said the reason that they are happiest is because they belong to co-ops. It floored me. This whole thing of working together, this mutual aid, this the, the 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 reason for our existence. That's one of the reasons I've came up with. This mutualism is at the core of humanity. When you talk about spiritualism or just what we do, is helping and working with each other. How much better I feel if my brother, whether it's a fraternity or somebody on the street, I have done something to help. How much yeah. better I feel. How much better the world looks to me. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also great if I need help, then a brother or a sister will come to my aid. But that's just so at the core of it. You know, there's somebody wrote this book called Blue Zones. And when they looked at why do some people, why do some communities have all these people who live to 100? They found out it's because they were in community. They were in co-ops. They were connected. They were, they were in something that had institutionalized mutualism. So you're born into it. You practice it. You are a beneficiary of it, and that that makes people live longer, but it also makes them happier. And that's really the funny part of this. You know, anytime you've ever done any social thing, something to help people, you know, it's so true. You feel better, right? It's like you will mm-hmm. think you're doing it to do something to help others, but actually it really helps you and us all. Okay. So if you want to feel better, and that's what I said after this lady told me, then go help somebody. Go form a mutual society. Now, the reason I brought up about leader, you were talking about a leader, is that you can be a leader or you don't have to be. Whatever your calling is and whatever you might want to be, and there are more leaders out there than one might think. But if you look at Obama, Trump, and Biden, leadership matters, <laughs> okay? Yeah. Uh, how many people have died in COVID that didn't have to be because of leadership? And then what now leadership is doing to help eradicate COVID-19. I mean, COVID, if anything else, really showed us how important leadership really, really, really is to humanity. Uh, yeah. So, yes, you can be a leader or you can go find out. And so you went to technology. What else can we do to, to mutual? One is to go to build-mutualism.net, sign up, and become a part of that. What else can we do? What else can the people out there do? You know, I think what what strikes me is the first step is to, as you think about your own community, literally say, where are the churches, the mosques, the synagogues, the temples, the yoga studios? Where are the credit unions? Where are the co-ops? Just map it and then see where you're oriented about helping. And that's where you can go and start to get your elected officials to start coming and visit with them and not telling them what they need, but asking them. And that that's really the difference. So I would suggest one more thing in this last minute. 
which I find in co-ops because of the second principle of one member, one vote, is that a lot of cooperators become those elected officials and they run for office. Yeah. And so that's the other thing one can do if you're in a co-op in one of these particular uh, groups that you talked about, your mosque. Uh, for fraternities and sororities, there's daycare centers, uh, particularly for the daycare co-op, can all yeah. come together and figure out what, what one can do to help out. I mean, Last minute, what do you want to leave people with? It, it really is the way for you to be the fullest expression of who you are. You You can be a change agent from the front of the church, the back of the church, it doesn't matter where you sit. It, we all have this capacity to, to make the changes that we want and to have a better life as a result. Be a change agent if you want to do it in a church, if you want to do it in a soup kitchen, if you want to do it in a fraternity, if you want to do it in any faith organization. Sarah, thank you. Everybody out there, go to build slash mutualism dot net, sign up, or go to everything dot co op and sign up. But let's get it done. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much. Please live this week cooperatively. Your news talk station.